up close with a legend, one of the founding fathers of the internet, Dr. Stephen D. Crocker, coming up next. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Minter Dialogue radio show. I am Minter Dial, host of this downloadable radio show, also known as a podcast. I'm author of the blog, themindset.com. T-H-E-M-Y-N-D-S-E-T where you'll find the show notes for this interview and I also write in French en français at minterdial.fr I had the amazing opportunity to have an up-close interview with Dr. Steve Crocker one of the three founding fathers of the internet who helped to set up the original ARPANET pre-internet and who was the author of the code for the seminal RFC request for comment Steve was elected vice chair of the ICON board last December and has been chair of ICON's Security and Stability Advisory Committee, the SSAC, since its inception in 2002. This is clearly a man who's in the know. Let's cut straight to the interview to find out more about Steve, his thoughts on what's going on in the internet and new technologies, and also to find out what he's up to these days. Hello, this is Minter Dial from the Minter Dialogue Show, and I am at Net Explorator Forum, the 2011 version. It's Friday morning, and we're about to start the second day, <clears throat> and I have the pleasure, distinct pleasure and privilege to be beside Steve, Stephen Crocker, who is a founding father for the Internet, a man responsible for parts of what happened at the very beginning of it all. And so, Stephen, I'd like to uh, ask you to introduce yourself and, and explain, uh, or maybe correct me on how I introduce you. Well, Minter, it's very uh, nice to be here. It's a pleasure. And this is actually a quite exciting forum here with uh, inventors of uh, tomorrow's technology. Um, so uh, you asked me to explain myself. So I've been around for a long time that I'm now sort of trotted out as a piece of archaeology and put on display here. I had the, uh, the privilege and uh, good fortune of being part of a team of people at UCLA that put the first node on the ARPANET, which was the forerunner of today's Internet. And as part of being part of that team, we had to work out uh, some of the basic ideas of what should the computers actually say to each other once they were hooked up. This led to the creation of the uh, protocol and the architecture for creating new protocols, which has pretty much uh, survived to this day. And uh, not incidentally, some of the social structures that surrounded all of that, the creation of the initial set of documents that we uh, tried very modestly to downplay their importance, and so we called them requests for comments, assuming that they would be a very short-lived operation, and now some 40 years later they're still the mainstay. And uh, a open working groups that uh, invited people to come together and share ideas and that have evolved over time to today's uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. And so that's sort of the, uh, the brief introduction. And I'm still kicking around. I've spent a lot of time on uh, security matters, and, uh, but on Internet architecture uh, matters overall. And uh, today I'm very heavily involved with an organization called ICANN, uh, for several years, I chaired the Security and Stability Advisory Committee for ICANN, and uh, I also uh, got on to the board of, of directors, and uh, just recently stepped down as chair of SSAC, and uh, now vice chair of the board, and, uh, and my life is now being consumed more by politics, much of which is fortunately internal and behind the scenes, but uh, it's, uh, it's what happens as you age in this business. Well, it's, it's great to have uh, the word architecture and archaeology in the same sentence. Um, my, my, so when we talk about ICON, of course, the, it's, it's, it's something that's it's fundamental, it's very important. It's based in Washington, as I understand it, or it's based in the States anyway. Yes. Um, can you talk about the, the evolution and, and specifically what part you're doing, which is in security and stability? What exactly does that mean uh, for people who are using the Internet around the world? So first a word about ICANN. It, it actually is headquartered in California. Uh, it grew kind of organically out of uh, an earlier organization um, uh, keeping track of the names and numbers of uh, associated with the network, the domain name system, the addressing system, the uh, uh, a lot of the internal protocol parameter activities and that led to a function that uh, is known as IANA. And uh, my uh, my colleague who passed away uh, several years ago, John Postel. Uh, had ran that for several years in an informal fashion, and as it grew to be more formal, uh, eventually a, a separate operation, which it is now ICANN, uh, was created to do that. Um, 
the Security Stability Advisory Committee was formed uh, following the events of 9-11. Uh, like every organization I imagine around the world, ICANN uh, took the opportunity to say, what should we be doing uh, with respect to security, and looked at uh, what are the possible flaws in the domain name system primarily, and uh, to some extent in the addressing system and other aspects, and formed an external set of, uh, of uh, advisors who were uh, very knowledgeable in different aspects, some of whom had very deep technical knowledge of the uh, specific parts of the domain name system and other aspects of the Internet, and others who were security experts and some who were uh, actually masters of both. Um, and so there's a, an interesting collection of very specialized topics that come up from uh, um, sort of what happens when you change the rules a little bit uh, to uh, uh, encourage one sort of behavior. Does it automatically open up the doors for other kinds of behavior? Uh, to uh, evolutionary issues such as uh, introducing IPv6 addresses into the root and uh, what issues uh, related to that. Some of them are, uh, are, are very uh, specific and uh, sort of tactical in nature. Uh, it, it extends the size of the priming query, for example, which is a startup process, and to what extent would that be an issue? Uh, to other uh, consumer protection kind of behaviors of uh, we, we have uh, you know probably close to 200 million uh, domain names that are registered across the entire system, and in any system that large, there's a variety of abuses, uh, names get lost or hijacked and so forth, and what can you do to improve the system so that users are protected in a little uh, a little better. So that's the kind of the range of problems that we would deal with. So uh, specifically when I, I'm t thinking uh, people are listening to this about um, the security of my system or governments that have to... Uh, make sure that they're, they're, the information is confidential. Is, yeah. is that, that's the kind of area you're working on, and, and you can have a, a, an impact on that? Well, actually, maybe less of that than you might imagine. Uh, the domain name system is very, very important, and, but it is also a very, very small portion of the entire system. So, yes, if, the, if uh, uh, somebody can get control of your uh, name, then uh, they can redirect queries to their systems and they can penetrate into your system perhaps. But that is, and, and although that is extremely important and needs to be protected, and we've spent a lot of work on that, um, there's an awful lot else that goes into protecting systems. And so you have the basics of operating system security and, and all sorts of things like that. And um, it's very important to have the, the broader perspective. One of the problems that we run into in ICANN is that it's one of the relatively few organized entities that uh, uh, looks across the entire internet and has a role and uh, it's not uncommon for people to assume that therefore it is responsible for everything and uh, so we try to we try to downplay that a little bit. Well, certainly its role is uh, global yes. or at least its, its uh, impact is global which doesn't come without controversy because America may be uh, the, the heart and the founding part of the internet, but it, it's uh, there's I would say I hear a lot of uh, feelings that well the, why should they be controlling the domain name registrations and everything? Well, how do you see that playing out? Do you see there's going to be more international involvement? Yeah, so um, the, the the perceptions are considerably worse than what the facts are. Uh, there is a very deep tradition of trying to act globally and, and uh, be uh, open. Um, there's very, very little direct uh, American self-interest uh, in, involved, and uh, I think the external fears are much worse. That said, there is uh, a very uh, enormous amount of energy uh, that we put into trying to be transparent, accountable, uh, international. The, um, and it permeates the entire system. Uh, although the, uh, the, as an organization, it's headquartered in California, there are offices in Brussels, in Sydney, and there'll be uh, in other parts of the world, and there will be offices uh, opening up. The board of directors, uh, by by its bylaws, is selected uh, with a balance, a geographic balance. There's a minimum of one and a maximum of five directors from any part of the uh, world. And, and the rules by which we operate, we try to be very, very open. Um, the, uh, the tradition in the Internet, um, just to step back a little bit, is uh, openness uh, in a very deep sense. All of the... Um, 
and I'm not talking about ICANN, I'm talking about sort of the, the, the broader context. Um, if you look, for example, at the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is a, an older organization and has roots that go back to the very beginning, um, uh, openness is so deeply uh, ingrained that it's uh, often uh, common to overlook uh, the impact. Uh, there are no uh, uh, barriers to entry. Anybody, uh, imp- uh, uh, older, younger, um, part of a big company or acting as an individual is welcome to uh, participate and to attend to make uh, contributions. There's no charge for documents. There's no charge for, for any access except for the, the cost of being at a meeting, but you don't have to come. Uh, and that is in sharp contrast to other kinds of standards organizations like the ITU and others that uh, are principally controlled by governments and by uh, big companies, and you have to be a member in you, and they charge for documents and so forth. And so there's a very sharp break. And, and then and from a technical sense, the architecture is open, and that's another very important thing that's led to innovation. And ICANN is one of the organizations that has grown up in this milieu, this, uh, this environment of, of, of a, a sort of deeply ingrained sense of openness, inclusiveness, uh, international, global participation. And uh, ICANN meetings, for example, are, are run without uh, cost. Anybody's allowed to come. And, in fact, uh, there's a subsidy for uh, making sure that uh, students and others can, be, can come in. So the, uh, 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 the processes are deliberately designed to be as uh, accessible and as credible as possible. Well, it's, it's beautiful because, I mean, you, you've kept the, the founding spirit and through that. But what is the economic model? And how does, how does I mean, it's without cost, but there must uh, clearly be... <laughs> Who pays? Some costs. Yes. yes. So, yes, the, the, there's certainly some money involved. ICANN's uh, annual budget uh, exceeds $60 million a year. Where does that money come from? Um, the, the, the budget, all of which, again, is uh, as part of the transparency, is all published and accessible online. Um, the majority of that money comes as a, uh, an added fee on domain registrations for those domain registrations that are under the, the contracted part, the so-called generic uh, uh, top-level domains, uh, ComNet, org, info, uh, you know, biz, and so forth. Not, no, but the country code ones, .us, .uk, .jp, .uk. You know, BR, Brazil, is, and .co, which is one of the more and .co, .co in Colombia, although uh, we just had a meeting in Colombia, and um, I, I think the, uh, the Colombians are very interested in being um, sort of first-class members of the community and not uh, sort of nibbling around the sides, just taking advantage of the fact that their country code can be viewed as a misspelling of com. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so there's that sort of behavior that, uh, and, and they're not the only one that have uh, that sort of attribute. Um, but the, to get back to the funding, the, uh, the majority of the money comes from the registrations uh, of the, uh, and, and it's, it's p- taken partly from the registries and partly from the registrars. And then there's a little bit of money that comes from the address community and, and some money that comes from the country code community by uh, contributions. But uh, if you look at where the bulk of the revenue comes from, it's uh, a very large port and comes from the, the com and the net and the org. Sort so of and essentially it's self-financing and it's got its autonomy anyway from, uh, from let's say, government subsidies, put it that way. That's right. There are some, uh, there are some uh, 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 legal relationships with the U.S. government, but they have no money changing okay. hands. And so uh, it's a very light hand from a government point of view, and uh, self-funded is exactly the, the, the right thing. So we worry quite a bit about uh, stability of the funding and making sure that the organization is stable and uh, uh, able to do its job not only this year but into the future. And so from that point of view, there's a certain business orientation uh, but it's not any different from any other nonprofit that has to look uh, toward its uh, continued existence. It has to survive. So not to worry, uh, people in the background, that's not a fire alarm. Uh, it may be a t- So, Stephen, um, all right, so I understand that about ICON. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you now is just about your project Shinkuru, which uh, you're involved in. And uh, tell us about that and um, what's going on with it. Yep. So thank you for asking. Um, so several years ago, uh, I looked back at what we had accomplished over the long arc of uh, developing the Internet. 
Um, and uh, one of the uh, visions back in the late 60s, early 70s, was that uh, the network would make it possible for people to work together uh, very uh, in a very facile way. And uh, when I talk about working together, my focus is more on small groups that are trying intensively to get work done, um, less focused on the mass social media sort of thing, which has been very, very important. But uh, perhaps my vision is rooted in kind of a, an earlier era. Um, and uh, the, uh, the peculiar thing is that for all of the tremendous development of the rise of e-commerce and uh, the co co convergence of data and voice and all of that, that uh, the ability to work together, although it's improved, email and instant messaging and uh, you know uh, various other conferencing systems, it's not quite as facile, it's not quite as nice as we all kind of expected it to be. So we started Chikuro uh, uh, nine years ago, a very small company, uh, to build collaboration technology, and we focused... Uh, first, and, and it's principally what I've been focused on, of sharing of files among small groups that are organized to work together that do not share infrastructure so that they're not part of the same company, that they don't all report to the same system administrator and so forth. And, uh, and so here's a, a typical kind of thing that, that uh, sits in our mind. If I want to send you email... I don't have to ask permission. I don't have to fill out a form. I don't have to pay anybody money. I just get your email address. I send it to you, and we can begin communicating. If I want to share a file with you, uh, there are now some upload systems and so forth, but none, none of them are ubiquitous where we all uh, participate in them. And if I want to do it uh, in a... Uh, more secure and controlled fashion. Usually this means that we have to go uh, pay for something or we have to go sign up in somebody's uh, administrative area and uh, perhaps somebody's in charge. And then if you're not part of my company, it's a very big deal to get permission for you to cross those security boundaries. Yeah, at the very least, you can say there's... A there's at least uh, one or two extra steps which, which clog it up. And, it, and when you add steps to the system, we know very well there's a drop-off. Yeah, and one or two steps might be understating it. So we wanted to, uh, we wanted to try to, to cross that boundary and build a system that would be very easy to use for small groups. And when I tell you small groups, I'm talking about 2 to 20 people. And, uh, and, and we wanted a high degree of security, but we also wanted a very high degree of ease of use. And mm -hmm. so we wanted to attempt to both of those. Uh, and uh, that ringing has stopped finally, finally. in the background. Oh, my uh, gosh. And the building has not burned down, so no. that's very nice. Um, the, uh, and, and so we, we built some very, very nice uh, file sharing capability, sort of a, a distributed micro file system uh, where you could set up a, a small group. You just give a name and invite people, and then uh, very quickly it's set up. Um, we uh, we ran out of the funding to do that. My partner uh, got seduced by uh, Microsoft and went off and worked for them. And so that project uh, uh, went into a bit of decline, and we're bringing it back into uh, – we're putting more energy into it now. Uh, but it's still a, a, a passion and uh, that I, I intend to – and we use, we use what we built before, and other people still use it. But uh, we're, we're going to uh, sort of relaunch in um, a short little while. I don't have a precise schedule, but uh, we're, we're going to get there. Well, one of the things that I look at is the, uh, the, the ability for companies to refine the desire to collaborate within themselves. Do you think there's a way through your system that you could promote uh, you know, breaking down of the silos? Is there any way that this might be uh, lead to better collaborative spirit? You know, small teams, little, it's light and easy as opposed to heavy and, and bureaucratic. Would that be uh, an angle that you think interesting? That is a very interesting question, and there is a, undoubtedly an interplay, no, no question, an interplay between uh, what the mindset is and the uh, ex habits and experience versus what the tools are. Um, I, I, I don't want to overstate what we're trying to do, and I don't want to, uh, to get too grandiose about it. Uh, my focus has really been for those people, those organizations, those teams that do already know that they want to work together, how to make it possible. Now, the larger question that you're asking, which is a, a very insightful and important question, uh, I think is to a certain extent approachable in the following way that where there is success 
of teams that are able to work together, where there is uh, positive experience and habits built up, that that educates and informs others and uh, uh, becomes the norm. Uh, just as in the past, you know, one could ask, uh, you might have, let me take your question and transform it back into an earlier day. Do you think that people will actually choose to send email to each other, or will that be against their grain? How will you encourage people to do that? Well, that's not a question that seems so relevant these days because people do it all the time. I think uh, the uh, the fact that it's there and if it catches on and it's successful, uh, it serves as its own education. And so that's the uh, the bet that we're making, if you will. All right. Well, I like that very much. Stephen, I want to thank you very much. Uh, thanks for participating in the show. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. So thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue radio show with Steve Crocker, one of the quintessential geeks, if ever there was one. It certainly was a great thrill for me. You'll find the show notes on themindset.com, where you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter. And if you like this show and speak French, you can find my other French language interviews on minterdial.fr. In the meantime, please come join the conversation at The Mindset, where branding gets personal. And catch me on Twitter. My handle is M Dial, M D I A L. And if you enjoy this podcast, please tweet about it or pass it along to a friend. Happy trails. Competitions in me, a convinced man in the arms of a woman. Despite revenges and struggle to see, live for the challenge so life's not incomplete. What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we